This episode is scripted by Andrew Stevens and Neil Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Neil Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 57 in which we will be looking at the influence of the classics in the original novel by analysing its role in what is known as classical reception, or the study of how the classical world, especially ancient Greek and Latin literature, have been received since the time in which they were produced ended, that time being usually referred to as antiquity. This impressive analysis has been written by Owsler member Andrew Stevens, to whom I am very grateful. I have not edited his words at all, and his full references will be included in the podcast notes, focusing on the reference sections of what he has written. I can only apologise if I mangle any of the pronunciation. If in any doubt, I will spell the word out as well as saying it. Classical Reception in Watership Down Richard Adams' biographical note in the Puffin edition of Watership Down describes him as having, quote, more than a passing acquaintance with the giants of English literature, end quote. As the remarkable range of quotations opening each chapter attests, this is a knowing understatement. Adams was clearly familiar with the giants of Greek and Roman history and literature. The three great epics of these cultures, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid, do seem to feature throughout the novel as does the wider Greek epic cycle beyond the Iliad. There are well-researched and argued scholarly works on structural similarities and te- te- narrative technique between the, po- the poems and the novel. Chapter 2 of Dr Hannah Parry's 2016 thesis, The Aeneid with Rabbits, Children's Fantasy as Modern Epic, is one fine example. Rather than repeat these observations, what follows are some entirely subjective interpretations of specific examples of classical reception in the novel. In particular, it will focus on how Adams takes key traits of established characters and archetypes, but gives them different outcomes. Chapter 1 opens with a quote from Aeschylus's Agamemnon, the story of the Greek king's nostoi, or homecoming, after the sack of Troy, one of the stories at the end of the epic cycle. There are several reception aspects to this. Like Cassandra, Fiber has the gift of prophecy, but unlike the tragic Trojan princess, he is not cursed to have his visions doubted at by all. Although the Freya Ra dismisses them, enough rabbits, crucially his brother Hazel, believe him to open a path to salvation. This is the first hint that Adams will use classical archetypes, but without tragic endings. Nevertheless, Fiver's visions are as blood-soaked as Cassandra's, and he is as terrified of them as she is. The choice of such strong, horrific imagery before the novel has begun serves as a warning that at times it is red in tooth and claw. The chosen passage is the beginning of Cassandra's vision of a brutal murder, which in classical Greek tragedy took place obscena, spelt O-B-S-K-E-N-E, the source of our obscene, and literally meaning offstage. Greek theatre features much reported action, and the passage foreshadows the novel's most dire event. Although the reader is given a full account of the destruction of the Sandalford Warren, they are possibly spared a harsher ordeal, as Adams has Holly and Bluebell tell the tale without the author's commentary. The reported nature of the destruction of a former home also matches how Aeneas tells his story to Queen Dido in Virgil's Aeneid. Interestingly, the available evidence strongly suggests that the English translation of the Agamemnon excerpt is Adams' own. Stepping back in the epic cycle, Homer's Iliad, set during the siege of Troy by a Greek army, is known for extraordinary depictions of empathy and moving scenes. Hector, preparing to face the near-invincible Achilles in battle, tells his wife Andromache that he has no choice, his duty to his father and his city come first. She in turn reminds him of his duty to her and their children, asking him to see his choice with her eyes. After Achilles has slain Hector and desecrated his corpse, his father Priam begs Achilles to return his body, asking him to think of his own father and how he would feel. During the siege of the watership down Warren, Fiverr's expression of empathy to Vervain for the death of the Afrophans feels genuinely Homeric, a tragic ending that they have brought upon themselves, but nevertheless one for which the prophet feels great sadness. Unlike Cassandra, though, Fiverr survives and his ending is a happy one. Fiverr's acute insight also helped save the rabbits from a Homeric danger earlier in the novel. The Warren of the Snares has been likened to the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey. Indeed, chapter 13 has a quote from Tennyson's poem inspired by the episode. However, 
This is a good example of how it can be tempting to see direct links between stories when looking for them. Though the Lotus Eater certainly fits Cowslip's Warren, it would be as easy to cite the Alloy from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine or the townsfolk of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery as similar stories. As well as the influence of Greek and Roman culture on our own, classical reception can include the study of actual events inter- reinterpreted as art and fiction. Chapter 3 opens with a quotation from classical-era Greek soldier and historian Xenophon's Anabasis, his version of the real-life events in which he participated, also known as the March of the Ten Thousand. Hired to fight in a civil war between two brothers for the throne of the Persian Empire, his Greek mercenary army were on the victorious side at the Battle of Cunaxa. Unfortunately, the brother that hired them was killed in the conflict, thus ending the war by default. Far from home at the eastern end of Asia Minor, the Greek predicament worsened when, having been invited to parley, all of the generals were murdered by a treacherous Persian satrap. Under untested leadership, and surrounded by thousands of enemies that wanted to kill them, the Greeks had no choice but to march and fight their way to the Black Sea coast in the hope of finding passage to safety, facing strange encounters along the way. The Anabasis has been described by Michael Flower as the master plot of the escape story in Western literature, and is also Xenophon's own account of his ascent to leadership and his role in saving his people. Adams may not have intended it, but the similarities of the watership down rabbit setting out in to a hostile environment to find safety are striking. They only have one ex ausler member with knowledge and experience of most Elil hoodoos and snares, and are led by the inexperienced Hazel, who, like Xenophon, grows into his role as the narrative progresses. A parallel exists between the Anabasis and Watership Down, much closer than in other works inspired by the narrative. Perhaps the most famous event of the account is the point at which the army vanguard reaches the summit of Mount Thaces, spelt T-H-E-C-E-S, and upon sight of the Black Sea, realise that they might just make it after all. They cry out, Thalata, Thalata, the sea, the sea, soon followed by the whole army, an event alone that has inspired entire scholarly works on its cultural significance. When Dandelion climbs the anthill on the down summit and joyfully cries out, You can see the whole world! This is their Thalata moment. We know that their journey has not been futile and that safety is within reach. Classical culture and history combine in the character of Bigwig. His defence of the run against the Ephraphans invites a comparison with another famous battle. During the second invasion of Greece in the Persian Wars, a coalition Greek army of perhaps 7,000 hoplites led by the Spartan king Leonidas were sent to the pass of Thermopylae to repel the considerably larger Persian army, whilst the other allied forces prepared their defences. With fierce fighting, territorial knowledge and the advantage of being heavy infantry against light, they held the invading force back for two days until they were betrayed when a local Greek showed the Persians an alternative route through. Up to 2,000 Greeks, including the famous 300 Spartans, remained to hold back the Persians long enough for the rest of their army to safely retreat, with most committed to fight to the death and fulfilling their promise. Bigwig's ferocity and bravery in standing up to the most feared living rabbit ever known is very much the Thermopylae of Watership Down. With so many lives depending on him, he defends the way in, holding back the enemy whilst the plan is enacted elsewhere. In the fight of his life, He stands his ground against a clearly stronger opponent. Even the prospect of death, a noble sacrifice to a poet for Bigwig, would simply be his final practical contribution to his task of holding the pass. Furthermore, his resolve against the enemy's attempt to win the battle with words also reflects the gallows humour of the Greeks at Thermopylae. Before the battle, some sources state that the Persians invited the Greeks to lay down their arms and have their lives spared. They are said to have replied simply, Molon Labe, come and get them. There seems to be a a parallel liberation in human and rabbit warriors facing the likelihood of death against a stronger enemy. With nothing to lose, why not taunt the oppressor? Having been offered an earldom in Woundwart's kingdom, when Bigwig invites his Russian warship of an opponent to Silfle Hraco u Emblia Ra, his humour is crude, perfect and feels very Spartan. Unlike the Spartans, Thespians and other Greeks who stay behind, Bigwig of course survives. This is further evidence that the characters and events of Watership Down may have similarities with the culture and history of classical Greece and Rome, but they are not simply adaptations. However, unlike Fiverr, Bigwig must show mutability.
It is easy to draw a comparison of Hazel, with intelligence, leadership and trickery, and Bigwig, the bravest and strongest of the watership down rabbits, to Odysseus and Ajax in the Little Iliad. After the death of Achilles, his arms were awarded to Odysseus, thus making him Greek champion. This outraged the bulwark of the Achaeans, convinced that as the bigger and stronger warrior they were rightly his, and he tragically descends into madness and suicide. There is a clear comparison in rivalry here, and Bigwig's contempt for the idea of Hazel being superior to him in chapter 11 shows his view at this point that a strong rabbit could never answer to a weaker one. At the novel's climax, we learn in his explosive revelatory statement of, quote, my chief rabbit has told me to defend this run, end quote, that unlike Ajax, Bigwig has accepted his and his Ra's positions, and the reader knows that for all the cunning and clever plans of smarter rabbits, without Thaley's strength, courage and willingness to die for his warren, the down was surely lost. It is important to remember, however, that any reading of the novel in any particular context is subjective, and interpretation can hinge on the fragments of evidence. This is a particular case in point, as without the lost paragraph, this take on Hazel and Bigwig's relationship would be very different indeed. A final note on classics in Watership Down is the title of chapter 48, Dea Ex Machina, means goddess out of the machine, a reference to the machines of Greek theatre that enables actors to appear godlike above the action below, solving problems and answering questions that the mortal characters could not. In a world where humans are a lil, it's a pleasing idea to think that not every one of us is an enemy to our rabbit heroes. Thank you for all your hard work on this, Andrew. An incredible job that was a joy to record. Next time, we begin our analysis of the 1978 film, Watership Down. Mm -hmm.